Good evening, everyone. Shubho Shonda. Society for Understanding Culture and History in India, Shuchi Initiative. We have a special event with Professor Dijendra Narayan Jha. Today we are live streaming on Facebook. We will discuss upon destruction of Buddhist establishment in early India, a case of intolerant Buddhism, Hinduism. In our studio, we have Professor Dijendra Narayan Jha, our president, Professor Ranubir Chakraborty, our vice president, Professor Nupur Dajgupta and Professor Shuchandra Ghosh. Before starting the event, we would like to introduce the eminent historian. Professor Dijendra Narayan Jha is the former professor of Department of History, Delhi University. He graduated from Presidency College, Kolkata in 1957. Thereafter, he joined Patna University to obtain his master's and PhD in 1959 and 1964, respectively, where he was a student of Professor Ram Sharan Sharma. He taught their history up to 1975, after which he joined University of Delhi and taught there until his retirement in 2005. Professor Jha was the sectional president of Ancient Indian History Section of the 40th section, section of Indian History Congress in 1979. He served as the General Secretary of Indian History Congress during 1985 and 1989 and as the general president during 2005-06. He was also elected sectional president of Andhra Pradesh History Congress in 1987 and general president of Punjab History Conference in 1999. In 2006, he has delivered the Professor Shushohan Chandra Sharkar Memorial Lecture organized by Pashtimangu Itihas Shangshad, namely Hindu Shattar Gomangsho. Professor Jha has lectured at universities and other centers of education in India and abroad. He was a national lecturer in history, University Grants Commission during 1984-85. During 1991-92, he became an honorary research fellow in the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla. He is the recipient of the prestigious H. K. Bar Pujari Award in 1995. He was also honored by the Asiatic Society, Calcutta, in 2011 for his significant contributions. For his books, he has been remembered. He is remembered. And his works, in spite of the 20, he has write a new book. It is going to come very soon. Revenue system in post Maurya and Gupta times, ancient India and introductory outline, Early India, a concise history. Feudal social reformation in early India. Contesting symbols and stereotypes. Against the grain. The many careers of Didi Koshambi, the complex heritage of early India. And finally, the rethinking Hindu identity. The myth of the holy cow among all others that is much more important. He has also edited Society and Ideology in India, Essays in Honors of Professor Aris Sharma, The Complex Heritage of Early India, Essays in Memory of Aris Sharma, The Evolution of a Nation Pre-Colonial to Post-Colonial Essays in Memory of Aris Sharma. Now I want to proceed the session and I want to welcome Professor Dejendra Narayan Jha, our president, Professor Ranubit Chakraborty, our Vice Presidents, Professor Nupur Dajgupta and Professor Shuchendra Ghosh. Over to our President, Professor Ranubit Chakraborty. Thanks a lot, Koshik. I hope I am heard. Yeah, you are. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. sir. Thanks a lot, Koshik. And 
it's a wonderful opportunity for me uh, to be able to say a few words on Professor Dian Jha, for us, Dijenda, whom I know for the last 40 years. And I think it's a red letter day for our organization, Shuchi, to have Dijenda uh, for this online presentation of his thought provoking ideas and essays, which you will very shortly hear. And actually, it will be read out by Professor Shujandra Ghosh uh, of the written text Dijenda has already sent us. Now, uh, I'll be very brief uh, on uh, to tell uh, the, our audience, particularly the younger generation uh, among our members and our audience, why a person like Dijenda is so important to us. He is one of the front ranking, one of the most formidable experts on Indian history, particularly it's the ancient or early past, which is, uh, which is captured by his numerous publications. Uh, Koshik has already spelled that out, so I'm not repeating that. What is the most signal point of Professor Dienja is his ability to generate new ways of looking at the ancient past of Indian's history and civilization by being empirically absolutely on the mark and yet raising new questions by reading the primary evidence in the in a new way and therefore he kept the debates on early indian history very very alive and at this moment unfortunately in the present socio political and cultural scenario in the in india any kind of debate is looked with great suspicion Everyone feels that if you raise a debatable issue, someone's position is being undermined or someone is hurt. That is not the essence of debate. Debates are there and the very lifeline of historical studies, otherwise history will be merely a repetition of what others have said before. And Dijenda tells us why debates and differences in opinion are absolutely crucial in the future of the studies of the past. And he is a shining example of this quality. Not only he is, he remains unflinching in voicing his conscientious positions in understanding of the past, but he is remarkably accommodative of the differences of opinion from others. Not that he agrees with many. Take, for example, if I am offering a personal position, I may have differed on certain occasions with Dijenda's formulation of early in India, but he would take my position and others' position who does not go exactly along his way, but will be comfortable with the different, different and dissenting voices. This quality, the sterling quality of the generation of scholars started with his mentor, Professor Aris Sharma, and which he carries so ably in his generation, is fast eroding. And for this sterling quality, Dijenda is so dear to us. He will generate debates. He will patiently listen to others' position without telling that he is feeling very hard, that someone else is uh, not agreeing with him or his sentiment. He will very sportingly listen to his criticism, will not immediately succumb to the pressures if dissenting voices raise a chorus against him, but he will very judiciously listen to other voices. If necessary, he might reconsider his position, but keep the debate alive. If the debates are stamped out of historical studies, then it will 
read like a party textbook and that kills historical study and here therefore we need professor dijenda amongst us for a very very long time and to in him we find the very best traditions of historical wisdom the study is the best essence and joy of studying the past not only of india but of any country how it should be done by creating debates and by generating new ways of explaining the past not merely for glorifying our past and therefore by glorifying vilifying some other the othering matter simply does not remain in his way of treating the past we are very fortunate to have him today and please also our particular younger generation you will find for today someone like dijenda could have just spoken he has taken the pains of meticulously writing the text of his state in a full fledged essay form which often i for example often fail to do and once again this is a quality we must all emulate thank you dijenda very much and we are delighted to listen to, to have you with us and we are eagerly all ears to listen to you now thank you very much thank you <coughs> well so, uh, before uh, presenting uh, the, wonderful yeah so uh, uh, may i request professor denja uh, to say something just before the reading out the paper by professor shuchandra ghosh well i thank ranveer chakravarti for saying so many kind words about me and uh, i always thought that <laughs> i am a plodder in the field of history and <laughs> ranveer has given me some ideas about myself which i never knew but uh, i thank ranveer for the kind words and i request suchandra ghosh to kindly present the paper the text of which i had sent already uh, to uh, dr kaushik sa <coughs> I think Chandra will now take over because I am not too well, so I can't speak for long. Uh, I thank you very much, and I request Dr. Chandra Ghosh to present the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. A uh, very good evening to our viewers and a happy new year. With the kind permission of the chair, Professor Nupur Dash Gupta, and Professor Ranveer Chakravarti, I would like to present, uh, as uh, Professor Dha mentioned, his essay, which is a very stimulating and inspiring essay for all of us, all students of history, and not only students of history, for all Indians. And uh, I will now go into that. The essay is titled. destruction of buddhist establishment in early india a case of intolerant hinduism the hindutva ideologues look at the ancient period of indian history as a golden age marked by social harmony devoid of uh, devoid of any religious violence and portray the middle ages as a phase of reign of terror Uh, unleashed by the muslim rulers on hindus central to their perception is their belief that the muslim rulers indiscriminately demolished hindu temples and broke hindu idols they relentlessly propagate the canard that 60000 hindu temples were demolished during the muslim rule though there is hardly any credible evidence for the destruction of more than 80 on the other hand even a cursory survey of historical evidence shows that 
demolition and desecration of rival religious establishments and appropriation of their idols was not uncommon in India before the advent of Islam. There existed many Brahmanical and non-Brahmanical religions and their sects in ancient India. Their adherents were not always friendly and mutually accommodative, but were in fact very often hostile to one another. The two Brahmanical sects, Vaishnavism and Shaivism, fought among themselves, and they both were constantly at loggerheads with the followers of the Shramanic religions. I propose to present a limited survey of the desecration, destruction, and appropriation of the Buddhist stupas, monasteries, and other structures by the Brahmanical forces, evidence for which begins to be available towards the end of the reign of Ashoka, who is credited with making Buddhism a world religion. A tradition recorded in the 11th century Kashmirian text, Raja Tarangini of Kalhana, mentions one of his sons, Jalauka. Unlike his father, he was a Shaivite and destroyed Buddhist monasteries. If this is given credence, the attacks on shamanic religions seem to have begun either in the lifetime of Ashoka or soon after his death. Another early evidence of the persecution of the Shramanas comes for the post Mauryan period, recorded in the third century Buddhist Sanskrit work, Divya Vadana, which describes the Brahmana ruler, Prushamitra Shingshunga, as a great persecutor of Buddhists. He is said to have marched out with a fourfold army, destroying stupas, burning monasteries, and killing monks as far as Shakolo, the present Sialkot where he announced a prize of 100 dinar for every head of a shramana. Added to this is the evidence from the grammarian Patanjali, uh, whose date is 150 BCE, a contemporary of the Shungas, who famously stated in his Mahabhashya that the Brahmanas and the shramanas are eternal enemies, like the snake and the mongoose. All this taken together means that the stage was set for Brahmanical onslaught on Buddhism during the post Mauryan period, especially under Pushyamitra Shunga, who may have destroyed the Ashokan Pillar Hall and Kukutarama Monastery at Pataliputra, which is modern Patna, in his beat to obliterate an important symbol of Mauryan power. The possibility of the Shunga assault on Buddhist monuments is supported by the layers of debris and the evidence of desertion of sites found at many centers of Buddhism, notably in Madhya Pradesh. For example, Sachi in Raisan district, which was an important Buddhist site since the time of Ashoka, has yielded evidence of vandalization of several edifices during the Shunga period. Similar evidence comes from the nearby places like Sadhara in the Katni district and Deol Kothar in the Rewa district. The destruction and appropriation of Buddhist sites continued in Madhya Pradesh even after the Shunga rule. At Amrapur, for instance, a Brahmanical temple seemed to have been constructed on a stupa base in the 5th century, and icons have been found at several sites around Vidisha which were transformed into Shaivite or Jaina places of worship around the 8th century. More than 250 kilometers in the northeast of Venetia, a Buddhist establishment existed at Hadurabha before it emerged as a major temple town from the 10th century onwards under the Chandela. Though the Ghantai temple appears to have been built on the remains of a Buddhist monument in the 9th or 10th century by the Jains, who also may have had a strong presence in the region. Outside Madhya Pradesh, there are many sites where destruction and appropriation of Buddhist sites and monuments seem to have taken place in the post warian centuries. For example, at Vidya, a flourishing town in Western Uttar Pradesh during the Shikana period, some of the present day Brahmanical temples, 
like those of Buddheshwar and Gokarneshwar, were originally Buddhist sites in ancient period. Here, the Kakti Mount, a Buddhist center during the Tana time, became a Hindu religious site in the early medieval period. More than 500 kilometers from here in the southeast at Koshambi near Allahabad, the destruction and burning of the great Ghositaram monastery has been attributed to the Shungas, more specifically to Pushamitra. Less than 150 kilometer east, Sarnath near Varanasi, where the Buddha had delivered his first sermon, became the target of Brahmanical assault. This was followed by the construction of a Brahmanical buildings like Code 36 and Structure 136, probably in the Gupta period by reusing Mauryan materials in front of the so-called main shrine. This shrine itself was built above the ruins of a large destroyed Ashokan stupa. Towards the end of the Gupta period, the site was occupied by the Buddhists to be reoccupied by non-Buddhists again. Other towns associated with the Buddha were also vandalized or appropriated. The Chinese pilgrim Fashian, who visited India during the Gupta period, presents a rather dismal picture of Sravasti, where the Buddha spent much of his life. Here, the Brahmins seem to have appropriated a Kushana Buddhist site where a temple with Ramayana panels was constructed during the Gupta period. In fact, the general scenario of Buddhist establishments in Uttar Pradesh was so bad that in the Sultanpur district alone, no less than 49 Buddhist sites seem to have been destroyed by fire when Brahmanism won its final victories over Buddhism. In North Bihar, Vaishali was an important city associated with the Buddha, where he had spent a few years before proceeding to Kushinagar. Persian does not seem to have spent much time there and merely mentions the existence of a stupa erected by the courtesan Amradarika. But another contemporary Chinese account, Wai Go Shi of Zi Sengzai, uh, this is dated between 265 to 420, describing the situation prior to his visit, reports that the house of Vimalakirti at Vaishali was destroyed. In the post-Gupta centuries, several Brahmanical thinkers and philosophers of different schools of thought from various parts of the country launched a massive ideological onslaught on Buddhists, which coincided with sustained attack on their establishments. The Chinese Buddhist pilgrim and traveler Zhuang Sang, who visited India from 631 to 645 during the reign of Harshavardhana, states that mm -hmm. the Huna ruler Nihirakula, a devotee of Shiva, destroyed 1,600 Buddhist stupas and monasteries and killed thousands of Buddhist monks and laity. He further tells that 1,000 Shangharamas in Gandhara were deserted and were in ruins and describes 1,400 Shangharamas in Uddiana as within quote, generally waste and desolate, unquote. Although he does not specifically attribute the desertion and destruction of these monuments to any particular individual, much of this destruction was wrought possibly by Mihirakula, whom the Chinese sources describe as the incarnation of a devil intent on destroying the true dharma. And the Raja Tarangini of Kalhana refers to as, I quote, a man of violent acts and resembling Kala, that is death, unquote. In some parts of the country, as in Kashmir, the rulers ordered the demolition of temples and Buddhist establishments, both as a personal vendetta as well as a matter of policy. Kalhana makes an interesting reference to King Nara, who angered by the Buddhist monk who seduced his wife, burned thousands of viharas in revenge. He also speaks of the 10th century King Shema Gupta, who destroyed the Buddhist monastery of Jayendra Vihara at Srinagara and used its material for the construction of the Shema Gaurishara temple. 
Among the Kashmiri kings mentioned in the text, Harshadeva was the most notorious. He systematically plundered and demolished Hindu and Buddhist temples for wealth and appointed one Uday Raja as Devat Patan, Devat Patana Nayaka, uh, the special officer to supervise the destruction of temples and uprooting of idols. Sources provide evidence of the Brahmanical vandalism of Buddhist monuments also in the eastern region of the Indian subcontinent. Zonzang tells us that the King Shashanka of Gora, a contemporary of Harsha, cut down the Bodhi tree at Bodh Gaya in Bihar, the place of the Buddha's enlightenment, removed the statue of the Buddha from the local temple and ordered it to be replaced by the image of Maheshwara according to one view. However, the Shaivites had already appropriated the site and Shashanka merely restored Shiva's worship. Although Bodh Gaya came under the Buddhist control again, during the period of the Pala rulers who were Buddhists, the place has in fact remained a site of religious contestation throughout Indian history. For traditional accounts and archaeological evidence suggest that the Mahabodhi temple was repeatedly destroyed and rebuilt. At the nearby Gaya, which figures prominently as a Pitri Tito, in early medieval Puranic texts, a site was appropriated in the mid 11th century to establish a Vishnu temple with its floor and railing made of reused material. The modern Vishnupada temple was, however, built by the Queen Ahilla Bai Holkar of Indore in the late 18th century. Less than 100 kilometers northeast of Gaya was located the internationally reputed Buddhist university at Nalanda with a vast monastic complex where Zwansang spent more than five years. Here, a Brahmanical temple, probably Shaivite, was constructed in the mid 7th century uh, that is soon after Zwanzang's visit, behind monasteries seven and eight on the eastern row of Viharas. Unlike the Buddhist buildings, which were all built of bricks, this temple was built entirely with huge dress stone and was completely out of place with regard to the general layout of the monasteries and occupied what was essentially a Buddhist site. Evidence reveals a complex history of destruction, abandonment, and reoccupation also at monasteries one and four. But the ultimate destruction of the Nalanda Mahabihara was caused by the Hindu fanatics who set to fire its library, though the popular view strongly wrongly attributes this conflagration to Bhaktiar Khilji, who never went there, but in fact, sacked the nearby Odantapuri Mahavihara at modern Bihar Sharif. Bhaktiar is also believed to have destroyed the Vikramshila Mahavihara, the center of Vajrayana, located at modern Antichak near Bhagalpur, and founded in the 8th century by the Pala ruler Dharmapala. But this too is not borne out by evidence, which seems to attribute its destruction to a conflagration and the attack probably by the Shena rulers of Bengal, who were inimical to Buddhism. Like them, the Kalachuri king Karna, 11th century, who was also hostile to Buddhism, had earlier destroyed many Buddhist temples and monasteries in Magadha. In this region, according to Taranatha, 84 temples were destroyed, including Nalanda. The Shenas, in fact, invaded Buddhist establishments also in Bengal. For example, at Shomapura Mahavihara, which is the present day Paharpur uh, in Bangladesh, founded by Dharmapala, the presence of the huge heaps of charcoal and ashes in the remains, an epigraphic reference to the fire caused by an approaching army and to the death of a monk in the conflagration, have been interpreted as evidence of its destruction by the orthodox forces represented by the Shenas. Ancient Bengal also provides several other instances of transformation or appropriation of smaller Buddhist sites by the Brahmanical elements. At Makura, for example, the Siddhesha temple was built on the stupas and at Gokul Medh Mahasthan and Birampur Dinachpur, 
uh, Buddhist monuments were converted into Brahmanical temples around 12th or 13th mm -hmm. century. An instance of the Brahmanical appropriation of a Buddhist temple has come to light last year at Basudevpur, uh, Bochaganj, Dinajpur in Bangladesh. Southwest of Bengal, Buddhism struck roots in Orissa on the eastern coast during the reign of Ashoka and remained greatly influential in the region for centuries. It received a setback during the 7th century when Shashanka conquered Utkal and Kong Utkalo and Kongada and the Shaivite groups of Pashupatas possibly made their first attempt to convert Bhuvaneshwara into a Tirtha. But Buddhist influence seems to have been very much undermined after the end of the Bhomakara rule around the middle of the 10th century. This is evident from the destruction or abandonment of Buddhist structures and the mushrooming of Brahmanical buildings over or near them during the rule of the Shomavangshis and the Eastern Gangas. Even the Jagannatha temple at Puri, one of the most prominent Brahmanical pilgrimage centers in the Eastern India, built in the 12th century during the rule of the Eastern Ganga ruler Anandavarvan Chora Ganga Deva, is said to have been constructed on a Buddhist site. While the Buddhist antecedent of the Jagannath temple may be contested, there is hardly any doubt that the temples of Purneshwara, Kedareshwara, Kanteshwara, Someshwara, and Angeshwara all in the Puri district were either built on Buddhist viharas or made of the material derived from them. This is true also of the Dakshineshwara temple at Bhagalpur and Taila Matha near Madhava, both in the Kotak district. Similarly, the Agikya Matha in Sohakpur uh, in Puri district and Kandhi Matha near Bajapur, that is in the Korda, and a Shaiva temple in Kopari in Balapur, Balasur district were all built on Buddhist buildings or their ruins. Examples of similar Brahmanical appropriations are available also in the neighboring Chhattisgarh, where at Sirpur or Sripur in the Raipur district, the main temple and the attached monastery built by the monk Ananda Prabhu during the reign of Mahashivagupta Balarjuna, uh, it's around 725 to 86, were appropriated by the Shaivite after two centuries, who carried out extensive repairs and changes. Other monasteries in the area were also taken over by the Shaivites. In Maharashtra, which is home to nearly a thousand rock-cut caves and temples, there may be many sites where Buddhist monuments were either destroyed or appropriated, but in the absence of a comprehensive study, only three of them may be mentioned here. They are Ter or ancient Tagara in Usmanabad district, Karle near Lonavala in the Pule district, and Elora in Aurangabad district. At the first site, an apsidal temple was converted into a Hindu temple of three Vikrama, whose damaged stone image dates to the early Chalukyan period. At the second, the Buddhist with the votive stupa in the Buddhist rock cut monastery was reconstructed into a large lingam so that the Buddhist site could become a Shaiva temple. And at Ilora, iconographies reveal that an enormous amount of violence took place there during the Rashtrakuta period and the original Buddhist caves were converted into Brahmanical temples. In Andhra Pradesh, there are several instances of Brahmanical appropriation of Buddhist sites. At Shezerla, in the Guntur district, a Buddhist monastery was converted into Kapoteshwara temple during the early medieval period. At Nagarjunakonda, there seems to have taken place a ruthless and appalling destruction of buildings during the time of the Guptas, though the local tradition attributes it to the followers of Shankaracharya. At Amaravati, where Shaivite presence is attested during the Eastern Chalukya period, a Shiva temple was built a few meters away from the great stupa on the bank of the Krishna, which was possibly an encroachment on a Buddhist site. Not far from here, at Dhanya Kataka, modern Dharanikota, Swansang tells us the numerous Shangharamas were mostly deserted and ruined, 
possibly indicating violent changes in the region. To the, all this may be added the Buddhist caves at Undavalli near Vijayawada, which seems to have been appropriated by the Brahmanical sects. In the neighboring state of Karnataka, which had been a center of Buddhism from the time of Ashoka, we come across two important places where Buddhist monasteries were clearly appropriated by the Shaivites. One was uh -huh. Aihole in North Karnataka, the cultural capital of the Chalukyas. Here, the Larkhan temple dating in the, to the 6th century was originally a simple square hall and possibly served as the central hall of a Buddhist Vihara. But it was transformed into a temple devoted to Surya Narayana with walls, windows and cells and roof shrines. The other example of conversion appropriation comes from the vicinity of Mangalore in South Karnataka, where a Buddhist monastery and temple called Kadarika Vihara was transformed into a Shaivite temple in 1068. South of Maharashtra, the situation seems to have been somewhat confusing uh, because Zuansang mentions Chola country as distinct from Dravira country. The former, according to him, within quotes, is deserted and wild. The Shangharamas are ruined and dirty, unquote. And the latter's capital, Kanchipuram, was home to some hundred of Shangharamas and 10,000 priests. There may be some confusion due to Zuansang's use of the Chola and Dravira as two distinct regions. But there is hardly any doubt that in the southern region of Buddhism suffered a major setback as a result of the Brahmanical movement led by Shankara, who is believed to have set up one of his four matas at Kanchipuram. The discovery of several Buddha images around the Kamakshi temple leads one to believe that it was built on a Buddhist building. It has been suggested that this well-known temple was in all probability originally a shrine of goddess Tara associated with Buddhism. It was here that the Kamakoti Pita was established. Another known example of appropriation comes from Tirupadiri Puliyur near Kuddalore, where the Gunadharishwara temple was built on the Buddhist ruins. An interesting example of the appropriation and reuse of Buddhist images is that of the Vaishnava poet Saint Tirumankai, who stole a large gold image of the Buddha from a stupa at Nagapattinam and had it melted down for reuse in the temple, which he was commissioned by the god Vishnu himself to build. Appropriations may have taken place at several other centers of Buddhism in South India and need to be examined. Our survey does not cover the entire country, nor can it claim to cover fully even the smaller areas it has touched upon. But it shows that Brahmanism never came to terms with Buddhism, though there is much evidence of interaction and mutual borrowings between them, which has been discussed by many scholars. Contrary to the Hindutva view of the ancient period of Indian history, as a golden age marked by social and religious harmony, our survey provides evidence of violent religious conflict before the advent of Islam. It shows that demolition and desecration of rival religious establishments was fairly common. Not only did the Brahmins vandalize and or appropriate Buddhist sites and monuments, they targeted the Jaina monuments as well. But that is a different story. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, thank you. My God, that's it long. It's not good, so uh, May I request uh, Professor uh, Ranavi Chakraborty to continue with his uh, chairing of the session uh, because this looks a bit, uh, you know, not very, very uh, good to for me to come in, in between because uh, there was a problem going on with my internet connection. So it's uh, I'm very sorry. I regret that I could not be there at the beginning of the session. So may I now request uh, Professor Chakraborty to continue 
with his chairing of the session and conducting program. Uh, Nupur, may I request that at least at this moment, the image and your voice is perfectly OK. And it's better <laughs> you conduct the session. But uh, the, I, I, may, I may sort of start the, uh, the proceedings of discussion yes, please. Uh, with a few comments. And then others may join. First of all, I must point out here, this is the ever youthful, argumentative Professor D. N. Jha. It is what he has tried to state here is a narrative of a very long history spanning at least for about 1200 or more years, starting from third century B or second century BC, right up to uh, 11th, 12th century, almost 1400, 1500 years, with remarkable empirical details and foundations. I have been fortunate enough to go through the text which he had written out with painstaking empirical citations. And it is not the immediate point whether one agrees with him or disagrees. The point is the methodology. That is crucial. When he is argument, offering his argument, it is based on empirical positions, not merely what he feels or what he believes, which has become the common parlance and common vocabulary in the present scenario. Someone believes and therefore it becomes an acceptable situation. History cannot be studied like that. The way Professor Jha has proceeded and placed his case, that is something to be emulated. Even if one wants to disagree with him, it will be by the classic position of Indian philosophical debates, first the Purva Paksha and then the Uttara Paksha. Now, since I, uh, I have... I have taken up uh, the opening up of the discussion, and I'm honored uh, to be able to do so. I, I would like to make two points for, and some also a little bit of interrogation to the Dvijanda, and I'm sure he will enlighten us further. Uh, this is not at all a cursory glance. It's an in-depth exercise into the primary sources with a particular explanatory mode. I, have, I am in league with him that the understanding that early India prior to 1300 was absolutely peaceful and everything coexisted, including religious, diverse religious sects and also different groups in society lived side by side with peaceful coexistence, which once upon a time are still considered corporate life in India, that even the society, the bordered and Jati divided society was in peaceful existence. That's a myth which he has very substantially exploded and I'm in league with him. Now, two points I would like to raise. Uh, if we look at the, the instances Dijanda has furnished to us, these are very well documented cases. To this, I might add one telling example, which I'm sure Dijanda knows. This is from Sachi and around second century BCE, a typical donative record by possibly a Buddhist laity that he donated a Vedika, also railing pillar and a Torana gateway with a very strong admoni admonishing statement that anyone who tries to take out these gifts for another shrine, one who tries to damage his gifts, will face the curse of being the killer of his parents, Matu Ghati, Pitu Ghati, the breaker of the Sangha Sagabhedi, and sucker of blood, Rudhiropai. This is one of the 
typical cases of vandalism at the very site of Sanchi in around 2nd century BCE, exactly uh, exactly echoing the sentiments of Mahabharshya Patanjali, where the Brahmanas and Shramanas are seen as Oinokulas. This is number one. And secondly, uh, I would like to seek uh, Dijendra's opinion that his, uh, his instances of destruction, hostility, and appropriation. This is methodologically very interesting to me. Destruction, hostility, and appropriation, three modalities of anti-Shramana, anti-Buddhist attitude on part of the Brahmanical society and Brahmanical religious sects operating possibly at three levels. Now, this is mainly shown, demonstrated on the basis of evidence which comes largely for a, what I may call the mainland of the subcontinent. Do we find exactly the similar tendencies also in the coastal society, societies along the, uh, in, in the subcontinent? He has rightly referred to the Bengal scenario. I have no dispute on this. But take, for example, in the coastal areas of Bengal, even in the Gupta times, combining the two copper plates of Bhoinya Gupta of early 6th century AD, he is a Parama Maheshara, and within his granted area existed a Buddhist Avaivartika sects, uh, Vihara, and nearby an Ajivika sect, establishment and next to it a Pradhumneshara temple. Similarly, as late as the 1145, we find in the in the time of the Burmans, who are devout Vaishnavas, but Buddhist uh, texts were copied in which the names of Burman, uh, Burman dynasty rulers have been mentioned and this is during the time of uh, Bhojabarman's last known record of 1145, when an Islamic shrine, Allah Bhattara Kaswami Bihara, figures in a very recently discovered inscription, read, edited, edited upon, translated by Purul. Similarly, even in the case of Sholas, who are well known for causing havoc in Sri Lankan Buddhist sites and ardent, uh, ardent followers of Shaivism, and the peculiarity of at Nagapattanam, the well known port sides, we have the built under the Chola patronage and land grants given to the famous Chulamani Vihara at the request of a non indigenous ruler from, from Subhadnadvi Dvipa. Now, I am only citing these two cases, it, I have other cases also. Is the attitude of Accommodation of non Brahmanical communities is more pronounced in the coastal areas, which are open to and cannot be close to diversity of thoughts, cultural uh, pluralities. Even if one wants to stamp it out, it's impossible. The coast is a place for uh, convergence of diversities. So, is there a different pattern? This is just a suggestion, and Dijanda might raise further. Points. The other is a methodological issue Dijanda has brought before us. This is his combining the process of hostile Brahmanical attitude, the regular destruction of former Buddhist sites, whether a vihara or sculptures or other establishments or pilgrimage centers. The classic case being very rightly the dispute over Mahabodhi temple, even as late as early 20th century. The, and then the word appropriation. And this, uh, we, are, we are familiar with the understanding of appropriation, cult appropriation as an inseparable part of the process of what 
Herman Kulke, B.D. Chattopadhyay, and more recent times, uh, to some extent, B.P. Sahu is telling this is part of the process of integrative polity. Yes, integrative polity is inseparably associated with Brahminical ideology. Now, appropriation to me is never an innocuous nor an innocent process. And if we follow Dijendra's uh, directional indications, then appropriation cannot be separated from uh, hostilities, current hostilities, and also the point of intolerance, the, also the point of destruction. It often at least points out, reveals a violent attitude towards something other. And it, it possibly comes out of what is the fear of the different. Now, this is something Dijenda has raised methodologically a very central issue. And therefore, what apparently looks to be a very integrated politician, what is called state society, integrative model leading to an integrative state society, how far this Brahminical attitude is conducive to in integrative polity. There, I have doubt, and Dijenda has kept the issue now further open with his fascinating empirical details and argumentation. If this is happening to a well established uh, organization of Buddhist Biharas and Sanghas, what would mean cult appropriation for? the so-called erstwhile non-Brahmanic, uh, non-Vedic tribal cults, where these have been taken over by the Brahmanical divinities in the case of Muni Nageshwari, in case of many uh, god cults, and that the three-pronged attitude of the Brahmanical sectarian cults one by hostility, vengeance, the other is destruction, and third is appropriation. These three, I think, operate simultaneously uh, or in tandem. And I think Dijanda will further elucidate. I don't take more time. I just end it up. This attitude, this mentality, apart from the actual acts of vandalism undertaken by various Brahminical rulers, this is also fascinatingly captured by the well-known Kashmir, Kashmirian dramatist uh, Krishna Mishra in the Prabodha Chandra. Thank you very much, Nupur. I have taken a little bit of time, but now you may ask other persons to offer comments and then Dijanda might give us his valuable insights further. Thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, as in my duty as a chairperson, uh, I have, uh, I now open the session for questions. We invite questions from the viewers. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that uh, since uh, uh, Professor Cha, may I request uh, you to uh, kind of just tell me how many questions you would like to take, because then we would kind of see through the questions and uh, present before you the most important ones which uh, enlightenment on which we'd really in, increase our knowledge, enhance our knowledge. So uh, would you like to take, say, about 10 to 8 to 10 uh, questions from the audience? Well, not too many, because I can't hear. So uh, I will try to uh, respond to Ranveer. And if you have any okay. other questions, okay. is there anyone else who is going to uh, ask questions? Uh. Yes, uh, I think that then we should go on uh, having your uh, responses uh, to Professor Chakraborty's uh, comments and questions. In the meantime, we will collect some questions and we'll just present uh, a couple of um, questions, maybe. Just a couple of questions. Um, I am thankful to Professor Ranveer Chakravarti for his comments, but he has forgotten uh, that 
I am uh, now more than 80, and I have forgotten much of what I wrote some years ago. So uh, forgive me for not commenting on the sources that I have used. You see, I would say that there was much give and take between Brahmanism and Buddhism. There is no doubt about it. And in different areas, whether it is coastal area or it is the heartland. But the fact remains that Brahmins were mainly responsible for the elimination of Buddhism or of religion. Sorry. <coughs> uh, for obliteration of Buddhism from India, uh, Buddhism was driven out of in this country. Uh, mainly because of the Brahmins, and this has to be uh, kept in mind. Therefore, when we talk about the tolerance of Brahminical Hinduism or Brahminism, well, I think we are not quite up to... Uh, right. We are not uh, being very honest. You see, right. uh, we have accepted many things from outside, but we have at the same time destroyed uh, much of what India had so that is very general observation that I could make uh, in response to uh, Professor Ranbir Chakravarti's uh, comments. But if there is any other question, uh, 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 okay. So we have another question. Um, which has come from Shagnik Shaha, and he asks Shagnik that, Shaha. Shagnik Shaha, uh, I think you can see it, uh, you know, below the screen. How did the Buddhists respond to the challenges posed by the Shaivites and Vaishnavites and Brahmins? So, say it yes. again, please. Hello. Hello. Nukoti, Nukoti, please repeat. Repeat. Please repeat. Repeat okay. the question for me. Um, yeah, I read the question. I'm just reading it slowly. How this is from Shaknik Shaka, and he <coughs> asked, uh, "How did the Buddhists respond to the challenges posed by the Shaivites, Vaishnavites, and Brahmins?" Well, in early medieval period. Uh, there is much uh, philosophical debate, uh, both from the Buddhist side as well as the Brahmins. I have not examined the Buddhist positions on uh, Brahminical challenge, but I think there is a lot of philosophical writing, particularly uh, on, in the Navinaya school, uh, Udayana Charge, for example, he wrote a lot of, against Buddhism. Uh, then Bhattaspati Mishra also wrote a lot against Buddhists. They are good against Buddhists. Uh, Buddhists have responded from time to time, but that was on the philosophical level. And I don't know, I have not examined how they responded on the ground whether they tried to defend the Brahminical onslaught or not. This has to be examined. I, I don't know the answer yet. Uh, but the point of tolerant Brahmanism or tolerant Hinduism, that, that is not acceptable to me. Exactly. Uh, there is another question. Just uh, I think uh, we can take this question and uh, uh, 
uh, if Professor uh, Jha would like to continue, then we shall go on. But this is the last question. Uh, from Biman Nath, uh, he asks, can some of the acts of vandalism, like that of Pushapta, be interpreted as the attempts of a new ruler, obliterating all monuments of the preceding ruler, and not really marks of Buddhism? That may be so, but it is intolerance nevertheless. What you say may be so, but it is nevertheless intolerance of right. something which you don't like. You see, uh, uh, somebody compared uh, the Hinduism with uh, Taliban's and they said that Taliban's also uh, destroyed uh, Buddhist monuments, Buddhist uh, uh, statues. And so why Hinduism alone? Hinduism is tolerant. Well, I don't compare, bring out such comparisons. I think Taliban's are the, were as intolerant as uh, militant Hindus. You see, I don't find much difference between what the RSS says and does and what the Taliban's do in Afghanistan and, or uh, Islamic State does. Uh, you see, uh, these comparisons are not very important. I think uh, uh, one has to keep in mind the basic point that whether we are tolerant or not, we are not tolerant. I am very emphatic exactly. about it. You see, exactly. we are not intolerant. If we had been tolerant, why there would be the case of Halak? Uh, why there would be case of Fahlu Khan? Why there would be case, uh, similar cases in different parts of North India? You see, we are not tolerant. Uh, I don't I don't live under that illusion. Uh, uh, so that is my response. Mm. Thank you, Professor Cha. Uh, uh, there is another last question. I I'll just take this question. It has come from uh, Shadhin Shen. Uh, Koshi, can you show? Uh, yes, Shadhin Shen. No, it has yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Yeah. Shadin Sain. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's, he's, uh, it's a comment. Uh, it's a comment rather. You have used him in your uh, sources. Uh, so this is this comes as a comment from the coastal areas of Bangladesh. We are finding increasingly new archaeological evidence manifesting attestations and appropriation in terms of space and structural remains. So. That goes to end of uh, 45 what you are saying in this particular uh, presentation. Uh, so there is another question. Well, I will, I will uh, correspond with Swadin Sen and try to find out more about this evidence right. and right. Uh, see whether it can be incorporated in some of my writings. Although I am not in a position to write anything new at this stage, I am totally homebound, chair wheelchair bound. I am not fit for uh, going to library. So I, I, I don't know, but I will uh, get in touch with Dr. Swadin Sen and find out what he is saying. Oh. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, there is just one question more, uh, and then I'll stop completely. Absolutely, I'll, I assure you. Uh, this comes from Nondini Jana, uh, and she asks you, how do you account for Nondini Jana? Nondini Jana, and she asks, how do you account for the architectures of Harwood, a large part of which were built during the Sunga period? Did it mean they were tolerant in Central India? Oh. Well, I can't follow this question. 
I can't respond. Uh, I'm I'm tired. I can't speak now. Uh, no, 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 no. It's yeah, okay, no sir. More, no more. No more. Uh, so, but is is it possible that I uh, oh. let let Vijendra take rest and he should not speak more? Yeah. He has yeah. given yeah. a. Let us. Let us. Nandini, Nandini has. Yeah. Can I stop. respond to Nandini with her permission? Yes, of course, of course. Sorry, uh, what, 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 you can ask the questioner. Uh, you give her my email. She can yes, send I me the question and I will answer the question uh, as best as I can. Oh, that's all I can do. I can't you, speak you. for long. No, Dijanda, you should not yeah, exert for I, I, I think uh, for uh, uh, I mean just a kind of a roundup uh, of comments uh, and then we can end the session I think uh, since he's ready he, he advised us that no, we should the no, no. please if, uh, if you take rest and shouldn't exert any part we, we can collect the question and we can and email, uh, the questions to professor Cha thank you professor Cha I mean uh, thank you Yes, thanks from us. And it's it's a uh, it has been an an extremely illuminating uh, session for us. Especially we have uh, I mean our career began learning from you uh, as a, as a teacher, as student, as teacher, and uh, your fresh thinking, your fresh thoughts, and ways of looking, your perspective on on ancient Indian history has enriched us uh, and. Uh, our students still now, uh, for example, your Against the Grain, that book, I'm using it for uh, uh, teaching my uh, PG1 compulsory class now. So, again, we are, I'm uh, expressing my gratitude to you as a student of your works. So, uh, Ranubinda, I think we can, you, uh, we can start with your comment uh, if you would like to respond to Nondini's uh, oh, question. I, I, no, no. I'll, I'll, this is only one exceptional That's case because of the discussion. Is a part of the discussion, yes. and I, I don't want to continue uh, with, uh, with taking monopolizing the time. I have already spoken a little bit. My only point is, Bharat, Bharat is a fascinating site, but uh, what is the Shunga period? Do we exactly know from at least 175 BC uh, the Shungas ruled for? Not more than 100 years, maximum, maximum. So, and Bharat does not close or begin and close with the Shunga times. And if we know from the pattern of patronage to Buddhist sites, like Bharat, like Sachi, like also some of the Western Indian caves, the majority of the preponderantly came from non-royal groups. It didn't matter with the, whether the ruler supported or not. From Sati, we have only three royal inscriptions. Actually, as documented challenge to put this establishment. And it is precisely possibly what Vijendra is indicating. It is irrespective of the king's hostilities or patronage, the Buddhist monuments of Sati, Bharat, also from other uh, sectors in uh, Western Deccan. Buddhist monasteries and sites flourish largely because of non-royal patronage. That is a crucial point. It is, and Shungo period is a misnomer in Indian history, political history level. And this is something the archaeologists have been misdoing, making a misdeed. Shungo Kushan Tatavahan period, meaning nothing. Meaning nothing. This is a wrong level used by field archaeologists for a very, very long time. And they have been retaining that. It's uh, a wrong nowadays, the, the, the tendency nowadays is to kind of change and uh, not really go for uh, this particular label, labeling as right. Shungo. So now we also are very cautious about using that label while teaching yeah. students. Yes. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So, so, and we have... Uh, so can we have uh, Shusandra uh, say something? You have read the paper thoroughly. 
because no no uh, rupurdi i think sir should be relieved so let nandini have uh, express uh, propose the vote of thanks okay. uh, he is very okay. tired he can always talk later okay. Okay. absolutely okay so i hand over to nandini for uh, you know uh, giving thanks to everybody. okay before uh, giving the formal vote of thanks i thank professor ronobi chakraborty our dear ronobidda for uh, answering my question uh now i give the formal vote of thanks on behalf of society for understanding history and culture in india suchi i extend our heartfelt gratitude to professor dijendra narayan jha for giving us this opportunity to hear such an important informative and insightful lecture and to be present along with us throughout despite old age thank you sir i take this opportunity to give thanks to professor ranubir chakraborty the president of suchi for chairing the session and inciting a stimulating discussion i take the opportunity to thank professor nupur dashgupto and professor suchandra ghosh the vice presidents of suchi to be present throughout the program and making it a reality i thank all those members of suchi both executive committee as well as general body who has remained present with us and most importantly i thank our audiences to uh, being present with us for making their comments and suggestions and for making today's session a grand success thank you all good night everybody good night thank you thank you we are ending well stay safe stay we safe are just ending well. the session we are ending the live session thanks to all of you stay safe and uh, we will be available in youtube so be in touch with youtube channel and our facebook page thanks to everyone good night and oh. let me offer my most heartfelt thanks to the energetic yes. young yes. secretary who is the life blood of this organization but for him we wouldn't have been able to even organize and contemplating the organize this like fine lecture by one of the stalwarts in indian history so it's all of you all of us this is not for anyone personally shokoler sir eta uddog so anyway thank you sir my pleasure working with you people and thanks to all koshik ke dhonnobad dite amar bhul hoye giyechilo ranavidya kore diyechen na thank you dhonnobad dewar dorkar nei